So the little story I'm gonna tell you about today starts with a picture, exactly with this picture. Now, the little man that you see there is actually myself at a time when I still had hair. And, uh, <laughs> and the picture was shot exactly on June 27, 1984, and it was my second birthday. So you do the math and you know how old I am. And uh, on that day, I received from my father uh, a beautiful Ferrari pedal car. And that's pretty much the only Ferrari I own since then. But, you know. Um, my father is an engineer, not a Formula One engineer, but he's a motorhead and is a big fan of Formula One. So since I was a kid, he would uh, uh, wake me up, you know, at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., uh, with an excuse of having a gelato together and actually watch the races together from, you know, all around the world in our living room in Italy. And um, we would discuss, you know, as soon as I grew up, as father and son always you, we would discuss which was the best driver, which was the best team, why some teams would win and others would lose instead. And uh, to a certain extent, we were always puzzled by one, one aspect, that sometimes it is not the most innovative team or the one with the best resources that was winning. And, you know, the usual answer was, yeah, you know, that's, that's luck. You know, they've been lucky. And I was like, hmm, yeah, maybe they were lucky, but I think there is something behind that I cannot really grasp. And you know that? One day I'm going to give you an answer. So that's exactly what I've been doing. And, you know, I grew up with the idea that, you know, I'm going to work in Formula One. You know, I'm going to do everything right to work in Formula One. And actually, you know, I studied well, got my good grades, got out of school. And guess what? As soon as I got out of school, the financial crisis hit. And it was very hard to find any type of job in, in, in Italy, especially in Formula One. So I, I sent my tone of CVs and I never even got close to get an interview. Um, so I started doing other things. I had a very mediocre career as a driver in Formula SA. I started up my own team at a university racing team and we ended up winning in Hockenheim in 2009. And ultimately, you know, I started working with a GP2 team, which is the feeder uh, category of Formula One. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna try everything here and we try to bring this team to Formula One. And if they make it, I'm gonna be in Formula One. Otherwise, I'm gonna do another thing that I always wanted to do, which is I'm gonna start a PhD in management. So you know how the story went. The team didn't make it to Formula One, and I started my PhD in management, and you know, when starting my PhD in management, I got you know, very interested in the topic of strategy, and when you talk about strategy this day, you talk about innovation. Innovation in the firms, innovation in the organization, in the products, in the processes. We, we heard a lot of story about innovations. These are some of the hard sales in uh, innovation literature, and you know, somehow when you read these books, there is a, you know, innovation is kind of worshipped, right? And there's a lot of talking about, you know, the world is changing, we have to innovate more, we have to change, you know, and it, it sounds a little bit like the innovation is the panacea of all issues, all problems, but I was not quite sure, because this would not answer to my original question, right? Why sometimes innovating less leads to superior performance. And so I started looking at several industries, you know, uh, car industry, cell phones, uh, video games, oil, gas, and ultimately I realized that a very cool setting where I could actually observe this was Formula One. Yes, so before me going on with the story of Formula One, can I please ask you a question? Do you all know what is Formula One? If the, uh, can you please raise your hand if you have no clue what Formula One is? Is there anybody here maybe from US? <laughs> no, because I, I know that, no, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Like, you know, in, in, in US there's a great tradition of motorsport, we know that. And, but it's slightly different, right? They have NASCAR, they have IndyCar. So when I present my studies in, in the US, I usually say, well, you know, Formula One, the cars look a little bit like IndyCar, but actually in Formula One, there are requires some driving skills, okay? Because, you know, this is a Formula One track, this is an IndyCar track. You don't simply go and loop. You actually have to be good at driving. But, you know, beside that, it's pretty similar. I'm, I'm joking, of course, I'm joking. Uh, but, you know, some colleagues of mine from, from Harvard say uh, that actually racing might seem like, a, uh, you know, very far from the world of business, but in fact, it represents a perfect laboratory for research, particularly for management and business research. Why that? Well, first of all, we have a clear measure of performance, right? We know exactly how fast the cars go. We know exactly that every team is trying to get ahead of the competitors. This is not the case for every industry, right? There could be some firms that 
prefer you know, um, prioritizing financial performance. Other prefer market share or visibility. Instead here, everybody wants to get ahead of the competitors. Then we have a very precise uh, record of everything that happens in the sport. We know every innovation. We know that there are regulations released by a federation that's called the FIA. They get changed every year and all teams must adapt. And at the end of the year, all these secret projects are not secret anymore. And the, the teams publish their blueprints. So you can actually observe everything, you know, in terms of every single bit of innovation in every part of the, of the car. Also, we know who are the drivers. We even know what the drivers had for breakfast sometimes because they talk in the media and they tell everything about their life. We know where Louis Samantha's been sleeping the night before. Well, at least we guess sometimes. And, uh, and so it's, it's perfect laboratory for research. Now, when I started uh, looking at, you know, at this question, you know, why less innovative firms were outperforming, one case stand, stood out. And the case that um, the story I'm going to tell you about is actually about these two gentlemen. On top, you will see Nick Fry, a uh, long-established uh, executive in Formula One. He started his career with a, a very famous Aston Martin, not in Formula One. Then he moved also to Honda, Braun GP. And when he retired uh, a few years ago, he was the CEO of the winning car at the moment, Mercedes Formula One team. At the bottom, we have one of the legends of the sport, Ross Braun. Uh, currently, is in charge of reshaping the, the industry and the rules of the game. He's, he won at the lead of a technical lead of uh, Benetton and Ferrari, eight world championships, eight in the drivers, championship eight constructor championship is definitely one of the, the finest of the sport. Now, what happened is that in um, between 2006 and uh, 2008, these two gentlemen were working for, for Honda Formula One team. Now, Honda has been for a long time in Formula One as a supplier. In 2006, they decided to enter the competition with a full car, so a Honda car, not just an engine. And uh, they have hired two very talented executives, and they put one of the biggest budgets in the field in the competition, around 300 million budget per year. That was a lot of money. Still today, it would be one of the highest budgets. But somehow, in those years, they failed in delivering any sort of significant result. And in 2008, this was getting a little embarrassing, right? So, and also, it was a time of financial turmoil. So at a certain point, they decided, you know what? Enough. We're going to pull out of Formula One. We're going to shut down everything. And this was an issue, because the, the, the plan that they had uh, here in UK would have left unemployed around 300 people. So they called the two top executives, the sporting director and the technical director, and they said, you know what, you should find us a buyer. But who would possibly buy a team like this? A team that had everything lined up to succeed. The best resources, a long experience, and now they also had a lot of depth. So they couldn't find anybody, and they decided overnight, uh, beginning in 2009, to do a management buyout. So basically, they bought the team for one sterling pound, uh, of course, with all the depth and duties that that uh, implied. They left, unfortunately, at home half of the people, half of the employees. They kept the two drivers at the time. Um, now, I hope there's no Jensen Button of Rubens Barrichello fans in the audience, but I must say, at the time, they were not some of the finest. Uh, Jensen Button had scored in 2008 the 18th position, and Rubens Barrichello the 14th position. So they were not probably some of the best in the racetrack. And they built a car with what they had, a very basic, no frill car. This was it. Very few sponsors, as you can see, very few stickers, so very little support. And they went and raced just with the hope of staying in the race. And how did it go? Well, on the left hand, on the left column, the red one, you will see the Constructor Championship. Braun GP won. Second, Red Bull. That was not the Red Bull that we know today. It was a very junior team at the time. And only third, McLaren, with only 71 points against 172 points of Braun GP. On the right hand, we see the winner, Jenson Button, where he won that year his only world championship uh, with 95 points, and Rubens Barrichello did quite well with 77 points. Now, the question is, how was it possible? How was it possible that a team with half resources, same drivers, same executives, did so well? The answer lies in this page. In 2009, Formula One underwent a major revolution, a technical revolution. And one thing that was introduced was the care. So 
all the teams at the beginning of the season were asked to reshape completely the cars. So the cars between 2008 and 2009 were very different. They were narrower, the wings were different, the engine was different, and they could use the CARES. CARES stands for Kinetic Energy Recovery System. Basically, it's a system that collects waste heat from the brakes, transforms it into electricity, stores in a battery, and get it available for additional boost. It's basically like a Toyota Prius, slightly more powerful, okay? Now, all the major teams were very interested in getting this technology running. Why? Well, first of all, they wanted to show that Formula One was an environmentally friendly sport activity. Second, they wanted to develop the R&D for this kind of technology that later on would have ended up in road car, and a lot of the technology that today we have in road cars comes from Formula One. But most of all, they wanted the opportunity to overtake their competitors. So all the major teams, Ferrari, McLaren, at the time BMW was racing, they decided to go for this technology. Um, Mr. Braun said, we don't have the money, we don't have the time to develop this, and plus, we really don't know how much power this technology can give us. There's a lot of confusion. We are really quite challenged in you know, coping with all the changes in the regulation of this year. Why don't we do a simple, no-frill cars, perfecting the type of knowledge and technology we already know well. For example, aerodynamics. And what they did, they improved what they call the double diffuser, which is a technology that was already in the car, they just made it larger and more effective to increase the grip. And the other teams who had the cares had issues. Issues of fire, shocks to the mechanics, and they barely finished the race. And it was even more surprising, as media pointed, that was the team without the cares they were doing well in the championship. Guess what? Adrian Newey, technical director, director of Red Bull, also didn't use the cares. Now, my father would say, okay, that was luck. Well, I said, let's go and see if it was really luck. So, with my friends and co-authors, Alessandro Marino, Luis Mesquita, and Jay Anand, we basically transformed 30 years of Formula One races into numbers. We coded for around two years every single bit of innovation over more than 300 cars. We coded all the regulation, all the drivers, all the performances of all cars, and we made a mega mathematical model. And, um, and we wrote a paper on it. And guess what we discovered? First of all, the relation between innovation and performance is not linear, meaning that it's not true that the more innovation you have, the better performance you receive. Actually, it's curvilinear meaning that after a point, the innovation returns flatten and eventually become negative. And there is a sweet spot where in stable environments, you are, if you hit that sweet spot, that right specific amount of innovation, you will maximize your performance. But what is even more interesting is that when environment become more turbulent, in our case, when the regulation change more and so the teams are more challenged in innovating the car, the curve recedes. And so does the sweet spot, meaning that we obtain the optimum point for performance at the lower level of innovation. So what's the takeaway of this? Well, when complexity rises, less is more. And you should not be afraid of thinking that you're not capable of doing more. I mean, look around you. Especially in time of crisis, there are so many companies who manage to disrupt the market just by delivering products that work well, they are simple, no frills, and they cater a specific service. And this is very true, especially in, in settings, in environments, where, for example, there is a competitor that has a much more advanced technology. And this has been true for a long time, since the times of the 4T. So, remember, there are no such thing as good or bad ideas. There are ideas that either fit or don't fit the environment. Before committing to major decision, before making major leaps, always try to understand what your environment is doing, how it's changing. There are three things you should look at. One, the magnitude of change. How big is the change? How does state one differ from state two when you observe it? Second, the frequency of change. How often do the change happen? Every week, every month, every year, every 10 years? And are they big or small? Because you could have very frequent changes, but maybe they're small enough to be easy to adapt. 
And finally, how likely it is that you are able to predict how the change is going to be, the future state. Because most changes, even the most radical one, sometimes can be interpreted, and one can adapt very well if is able to predict. So try to predict your environment, and if it's unpredictable, note that down. Reduce complexity during turbulence, and wait for a stable moment to accelerate. But don't give up your ideas. If you have to hold back, don't forget them. Don't put them away. They might be perfect at a different point in time. Think about this. February 5th, 1996, Business Week was celebrating the fall of our American icon, Apple. Exactly 10 years and one day after, Steve Jobs' Magic Kingdom. <laughs> same, same newspaper. And it took us 10 years to understand that computers were not just very functional machines, but also beautiful machines. Objects of design that tell us something about who we are and what we want to be. And talking about what we want to be, what about childhood dreams? When is the time to, to really push the envelope on your dreams, on your ideas? Well, I don't have an answer to that. I can only tell you my experience. After a few years of publishing my studies and luckily getting some media exposure and some awards, some teams call me up and say, hey, Paolo, why don't you come to the pits to give us some help? So eventually, I ended up doing the job of my, of my dreams. It's just it was not the conventional way, because when I was ready for it, the environment was not ready for me. And so to leave you with a sentence from the great driver, Mario Andretti, if things seem under control, you're not just going fast enough. And when things are under control, that's the time to accelerate.